All right, welcome to Women in Music. Today I am talking to uh, who I know as the hip hop academic. Um, and I did not know your name, but I saw it because we're on Zoom. It says Amy. So, <laughs> so now I know you're, you're Amy. Um, but like, I'm so psyched to talk to you. And just to, I'm going to ask you some questions because I want you to talk, but just to like start laying this out. So I met you through um, Instagram. I had uh, talked to DJ Adada. I'll put the card up here. So if you guys haven't watched that yet, that was awesome. Watch it. And um, she is in Berlin, Germany. And she's doing, she's like a turntable She's doing hip hop, um, DJing. Now she's producing her own music. And so you had talked to her and you reached out to me and thought maybe I was in Germany or Europe yeah. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I was not, but I just loved meeting you on on instagram because uh amy known as hip-hop academic is actually an academic in music which is called and wait i want to get this right ethnomusicologist Correct. and i just am as an as a academic myself in the sense of i went to a lot of school for a long time uh <laughs> i appreciate that because i know that you're you're doing like really cool things and I wanted to talk to you because I don't think a lot of people realize that this exists or if they do they don't know much about how you know one makes a career in uh, studying something as cool as German hip-hop <laughs> so I would just um, love for you to just like tell us a little bit about yourself like you know where you were because I knew you were you're from America and just how you got to where you are now and like what you're doing. Cause I think that's just going to be really cool to hear. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And yes, uh, they need to watch DJ Adada's, you know, because she is an amazing woman here. She's an amazing person, but yes, I am from the United States, from the state of Indiana, from the city of Bloomington. And my home university is Indiana university in Bloomington. And I'm a doctoral student in the folklore and ethnomusicology department. Okay. And I'm, in, I'm in Berlin right now doing pre-dissertation fieldwork research on my topic. It's the second time I've lived here. I was here in 2015-16 to do the same research, but that was when I was in a master's program. Oh, okay. And the reason I'm in Berlin is because I'm part of an exchange that is between my university and Freie Universität here in Berlin. Okay. So both times I've come over as a study abroad student. And ethnomusicologists, um, there are many programs in the United States that focus on this degree, but my particular university was is a very storied program because it's where the program one of the genesis points of the program in the united states oh cool which is great and ethnomusicologists study the intersection of music and culture how a group of individuals use music for their identity okay or in tandem with their identity which is so pertinent nowadays i i mean, i I shouldn't say nowadays, obviously there's a long history, but I feel like that's become even stronger and stronger through, throughout history seemingly. Right, I think so too, I think so too. Um, so let's see, what else would you wanna know? Would it be? So you're gonna be a doctor in music, which I'm sure people <laughs> didn't know you could be, right? <laughs> I, in a couple of years, yes. I mean, I'm not quite there yet, but I'll, I will bust it out. Trust me, I will finish it. You know how that is. <laughs> so, but, uh, so you're specifically um, focused on hip hop in uh, the European culture or in Germany, or can you just talk a little bit more about what you're you're studying specifically? I research women in German hip hop. Okay. So within the country of Germany. I do talk to men to get a perspective on how women are treated and what their experiences are from a male perspective in the business. Okay. And when I first came over here in 2015, 16, I primarily focused on MCing and DJ. Okay. When, when I came over here for this field work period, and I've been here since the late September of last year, I expanded it to all the four elements. So graffiti, plus break the b-girling, break dancing, and then of course, emceeing and DJing. Okay. 
Now, how I came upon that topic, <laughs> it was, honestly, it was almost happenstance. I did all my education at IU. I'm a non-traditional student, meaning I went back to school when I was older. Okay. At traditional age, I got a small law degree, a paralegal degree. Okay. And I worked in the real estate field for 20 years. And then I decided that I wasn't done. And my youngest was old enough. So then I re-entered school at, at IU for a four-year degree. And I did my undergraduate in English with three minors, medieval studies, European studies, German, and then a concentration in creative writing. Okay. And then I moved into European studies at the same university. And that's whenever I came across the idea for this research topic. That's awesome. Do you listen to hip hop? Are you like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so of course it's not the only genre. I listen to, to all kinds of music. I mean, tomorrow I'm going to the opera for the first time here, just out of curiosity with the friends. Oh, cool. But primarily, yes. I do listen to hip hop. I'm old enough that I remember way back to Rapper's Delight was the first song I ever heard on the radio. Okay. And, and I'm telling my age there, but that, that's good with me. So, <laughs> so yes, but I became interested in it because an undergraduate instructor exposed us to German hip hop, one female artist, and her name was Aziza A. And she had a big album hit in 1997 called S is Zeit. It is time. So when I heard that as an undergraduate, I thought that's really interesting. Her lyrics were about belonging to no different, no specific place, like being a third cultural chair in between two worlds. Hmm. And she was rapping from the standpoint of being a Turkish German resident. Okay. So I started learning about the Turkish diaspora in Germany through the German culture classes. And whenever it came time to declare a topic in my MA, I literally just declared, I think that I need to start looking into women rappers in Germany, uh -huh. especially of this particular ethnicity, if there are no other diasporas that do that. And everybody came on board really quickly with that idea because no one had ever heard of it. <laughs> yeah. And then it just kind of, it honestly spiraled from there. I got the exchange to come over and do six months worth of research as an MA student, completely untrained, had no idea what I was doing. Lucky enough that I hit spot on five women to interview, came back to the U.S., wrote my thesis. My MA thesis is on an artist named Ebo. I completed Turkish classes intro classes that summer and went right into doctoral study. So I was doing all of wow. that simultaneously. And um, then I finished the thesis, did another year of doctoral, and then lo and behold, they sent me back over here for another exchange on the awesome. same topic. But I did expand it to be women and social activism and their effect on Germany's current socio-political state. Okay. So it needed to have some depth to it the well, women yeah because you you've got to write like a few hundred pages now right i mean exactly. <laughs> it's a little bit longer <laughs> it also kind of felt like i was just out here going to clubs which is what <laughs> i did and still yeah. do making videos and pics but i was like it's it's what you know what's going on with this though how is it affecting germany okay how is it affecting these women and researching for two years while I was in the States and talking to a few online, that's whenever I started going into the social activism perspective. And of course, global perspectives changed on that in the time frame I was in the States with the Me Too and all kinds of other things. And it kind of naturally went towards that avenue. This is so, this is so cool. This is so deep. Uh, there's a few things I just want to like dig into <clears throat> uh, a little bit more. Um, just because I think it's so interesting. So I'm trying to figure out where to start. So let me like go back a little bit. So, uh, not to get too far off topic here, but I think it's important to like call out that, um, you know, you had a career as a paralegal in the real estate oh, yeah. uh, area and, and in your later years decide, Hey, I, I'm interested in other stuff. I want to go back and, you know, do this. Like, I think that's such an important message for people because I'm 43 
I tell people my age. I have no problem with it. And I've done so many different things throughout my life. Um, I've done enough school. I cannot imagine going back to school. I, I have a master's. <clears throat> I have a dual master's, one uh, master's in business, a master's in accounting, and I actually have a JD, so I'm an attorney. So that means that I went to school for four years, plus two, six, plus three. I went to school for nine years. Right. But that's, you know, so I'm done. <laughs> but but the, uh, the things <clears throat> that I do now is like, you know, there's so many interesting things in life. And even at age 43, took up like making beats and and uh, doing this, doing this podcast, <clears throat> excuse me, video podcast. But I think that's so important for people to to realize, like, you're never too old to start something new. And look where it's brought you. This is so interesting. You probably never even imagined, you know, that you were going to end up where you are now. <laughs> oh, no, no. You know, I I have a say or I have a way of explaining it to people that are close to me. So now we're close to everybody here. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I entered school for this continual degree at 41. Mm-hmm. And 41 is a pivotal age. We all know that. It's midlife crisis, genesis, <laughs> usually. Instead of buying a new car <laughs> or mm-hmm. having an affair, I literally went back to school. Mm-hmm. That's what it started as. It started as an, oh my God, I'm 41. I always have wanted a PhD. I either just check the full-time job and get a part-time and be a student for the next 10 years, or my life is gone. I mean, I'm not getting any younger. Right. Now, it sounds like it's easy. Nuh-uh. Oh, I mean, no. I, everyone <laughs> sacrificed a lot around me. I sacrificed a lot financially, still yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But I'm the kind of person that believes that experience is one of the best teachers. And you've already said it. A person is never too old to make a new path. For themselves. I made a ten-year plan ten years before I was going back to school. I mm-hmm. literally drew out a ten-year plan. Right. Along, you know, and along the way, I want to be here and here and here, and I had to follow it. So it took a lot of planning. I started when I was about 31 when I started that. Okay. But that's what it took. It just took baby steps along the way. And you knew you wanted something, and and yeah, yeah. I knew I wanted it, but I didn't quite know what I wanted it in. I right. knew that I wanted the ultimate goal, and then what I wanted kind of formed itself as I went along. Awesome. What do you think? Um, I, I'm just, I'm jumping over all around. I know. Uh, what do you, and once you get your doctorate, do you want to teach? What, what do you, what would you like to do? I, I am an educator. I mean, I know that, but education can be in a university setting. It can be in a high school setting. It can be in an NGO. It can be in a social activist organization. It can be anywhere. Mm-hmm. For me, whenever I get my doctoral, when my doctoral degree is finished, I'll be about 53 years old. Right now I'm 51. Mm-hmm. So my goal, grabbing the brass ring, gold ring, whatever you want to call it, is to work in the music business. That's my number one goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, like I said, I have that little law degree from way back. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very interested in copyright law. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the things that I research. <laughs> very pertinent <laughs> right now in the U.S. for uh, yeah. th- there's a lot of stuff going on. I'm not, you know, an expert in any way. There's attorneys yeah. out there that know far more than me. I also have in my real estate. I was a property manager for 11 years, so I I have done plenty of organizational event management, business organization management. Mm-hmm. So I would. I wouldn't mind going into an employment position where I managed artists mm-hmm. and I cool. arranged their, their events and their concerts. Along with that also is the social activism because I do believe in that and I believe I'd be content also working in a social activist organization. Mm-hmm. As long as I'm working to educate people on what they can do to change their lives and attain what is important for them long term short term then i feel like all of the money that i've sacrificed the time and the effort is going to be worth it because i'm going to be able to help other people and that's my ultimate goal 
That's awesome. I, I'm really glad I met you. I love this conversation. This is so good. This is really great. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of, yeah, it's, that's so cool. I mean, obviously you have so many talents and I don't think people, well, I'm trying to phrase this the right way. Sometimes when we're older, we don't give ourselves enough credit for all of the skills we've built during all those earlier years. And I love how you connected, you were able to connect them and say, yeah, you know, I, I got this law degree. I worked in the real estate industry. Um, I managed buildings and then put the, everything together and say, this is how this can benefit. I can use this and, and help somebody with this. Like, I think sometimes uh, people don't give themselves enough credit for <clears throat> the skills that they've built over time. Um, but that's so cool so many cool things you can do and i'm glad people are 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 going to be able to hear this story um <laughs> because i'm sure people never thought like i know when i was growing up i didn't i didn't know this existed i mean maybe is, is it so can i ask like when when did this degree or pathway start like is this uh last 20 years 30 years is it newer i, I have no idea no, for me, I started playing piano at age four. My mom started taking me piano lessons. She realized that I had a very good memory and I showed an interest in music because I could memorize lyrics from almost any song that came over the radio. We're talking, this is like early 1970s of the songs I'm singing, the pop culture songs. So I did play piano for many years. I was instructed in my hometown um, up to a level where no one could teach me in my, I lived in a different city, in the small city I'm originally from. Okay. And I also played percussion from the fifth grade on up into high school. So I was always interested in the beat as well. And more so in the beats than the actual piano playing, but I did like the piano. Um, I didn't go into a career in music right at first, though. Right. I took a different path. I had a young son. I went into the paralegal degree so that I could get a degree so I could raise him. Ethnomusicology didn't come across my radar, honestly, until I was a master's student. Okay. And one, of the, one of the biggest influences, actually the influence, and the reason I'm in the program I'm in now is my in German called the doctor father, is my main advisor. And his name is Professor David McDonald. He is um, in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at IU. And he was very pivotal for me in telling me when I was deciding where to apply for PhD programs. He was my, also my doctor father for my master's program as well. And he said, Amy, you're an ethnomusicologist. I don't think you <laughs> realize this yet though because you're doing exactly what this program is designed to train people to do. And it was, and that was when I lived in Berlin last time when this was all going on and I was applying okay. for doctoral programs. So I applied. And I mean, I'd heard of the word ethnomusicology, but I, I hadn't given it a lot of thought. How, how long has a department existed at IU? Do you know, like when it was started? Um, the department was started decades ago. Okay. Um, I believe in the 1950s, although if I'm oh, wrong, wow. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yes, it's, it's been a long, long time. Um, very influential musical and folklore people, individuals, academics have come out of this program. Regardless, they offer um, undergraduate degrees in it. They offer master's degrees, PhD degrees. So the department is dual. Um, okay. As an ethnomusicologist, I also take folklore classes as well, because those two topics cross over. They intersect quite a bit. Okay. Um, and so going back to, so you played, so you yourself were a musician at a very young age. So do you still play? Are you, do you still have any instruments that you play? I do not play in public very often. Um, Quite private even. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, there's a, I'm, right now we're in the student building where I live in Berlin, and there's a piano here, and I go down and play it. That's nice. Um, Percussion-wise, I haven't come near a trap set in years. <laughs> uh, um, what I do, honestly, 
the most strongly that ties me to music is I write poetry. Oh, nice. In my creative writing concentration, I was a fiction writer, but I took poetry classes. And the poetry I write is spoken word. So if you can, you know, you can easily make the connection there between poetry oh, and rap. Absolutely. I now, used to, yeah. I don't rap. I don't, I have not okay. gotten up on the stage and rap, but I mean, I mean, when I'm alone, from the time I was little, I was rapping about making my bed. So, so that's your next, that could be your next thing. And you just don't know it yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know about my, my audience and maybe myself for that gig. Hey. But it's something I need to get up there and try because I need to put myself in the shoes of the artist that I interview. Honestly. I, uh, I, I DJed for, for a long, long, long time <clears throat> out and about. And one of the things I would do once a month is uh, there was a event called the Amazon Poetry Slam in yeah. up in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And there's this amazing woman named Ren Gender. Um, and I'm going back. That's why I'm, I'm putting names yeah. out there. And she threw this, this, this poetry slam every month. And it was for women. So it was only women. Yeah. And uh, so it attracted, you know, a lot of academics in the Boston area, a lot of lesbians, you know, like a, a lot of, you know, because after it was at like a, a club, so you could drink and eat during, and then afterwards I would DJ like a, a party. But my point of the story is it was just amazing um, being in the Boston area and seeing all the different types of women who would get up there and, you know, do the poetry slam and, and the spoken word and just from so many different backgrounds and cultures and, and just how almost healing it was for, for so many of these women. And uh, yeah, wow, flashback. That's my next step. I haven't gotten on stage with the spoken word. There's, I've got the poems though. But yeah, spoken word is an art. It's an art, yeah. form. It's a performance art form that's, that's very technical. And it is very cathartic for them, it looks mm -hmm. like whenever I go to them and I see them, so. Wow, so that's cool. I, I'm tell, I, I can see this. I, you're going to have an album. I can see it. <laughs> no, I doubt that. <laughs> I'm a never better know. Person. Ten years yeah. from now, you're never too old. That's true. <laughs> uh, so, like, what kind of music are you into? I know you said you listen to all genres, but is there, like, <clears throat> I think we all have, like, certain bands or, or, or individuals that come to mind when we think of, like, either what we listened to growing up that we loved or we can listen to now. Is there anyone that sticks out that you, mu music wise, that you're, that you dig? Well, I, you know, just yesterday I keyed up Karen Carpenter. Okay. From, simply because she has a lower voice and my voice is that tone as well. So I always feel like I sound really good if I'm belting out a song of hers. Okay. Um, some of the old school rappers that I listen to, I mean, Tupac and Biggie, of course, they're on another plate up there with themselves for everyone. But artists like MC Light. Actually, oh, I'm, really, I'm really pumped. She's in Berlin in three weeks. And trust me, I, I've had my ticket for a month now. Um, That's cool. MC Light, Missy Elliott, of course. Of course, um, Lauren Hill. Some of the more contemporary artists that I listen to are, one of them is Yukon Blackrock. She's a South African rapper. She's very good. Um, she's actually going to be there at the MC Light concert too. So I'm looking forward to seeing her. Um, I don't, uh, let's see, Choosing an Exile. They just released an album called Black Beans. That's another rap album in the States. That's really good. Uh-huh. Um, I listened to an R&B singer out of France called Cornille. Okay. He's pretty good. And then, then there's this other one I want to, I want people, well, if they like folk music out of different countries, let me, I got a note. Yeah, no, go for it. Name is hard off the top of my head to remember. Um, Sandra N. She's a Cameroonian artist. Sandra, and I how do you spell the last name? Yeah, well, it's more Sandrine. She goes, oh, San okay. Sandrine, and um, she has a song out that's just really good. It's a Cameroonian folk song, and it's just absolutely beautiful. I don't speak, it's in Douala. I don't speak that language at all. Okay. Her voice is just really gorgeous. And, um, oh, the Danish pop group, Lucas Graham. I really like them. Okay. You know, so I, and classical music because of all the years in piano that I played classical, but. 
So, I mean, it goes back and forth. It depends on my mood. Yeah. You know, how that, but that's, I think, with everyone. It depends on our moods, what we want to, yeah, yeah. how we want music to affect our emotions. Absolutely. And especially with, like, uh, Spotify, I feel like, like, their tech, the technology, regardless of what you use, has made it, like, so much easier for you to create those types of playlists where you can go from, you know, listening to 90s hip-hop to listening to, yeah. you I, know, early 2000 folk <laughs> and back again. Whether you, you curate it yourself or you rely on somebody else to curate it for you. Um, so, yeah. You know, I have, I am so grateful I grew up in pre-internet age because I, you know how it is, you have a fine appreciation for internet capabilities. Uh Oh my God. I mean, how heavy was my CD case and my LP case before then? And the first time I ever was able to download a thousand songs onto a portable player, I literally almost cried tears of joy. So yeah, yeah. I mean, my phone is my life, and yeah. it has my entire music library, which is thousands and thousands of songs. So. I, uh, I the other day I was I was talking to my kids. I have I have five year five year old twin girls, and they're really into music now, and like all the pop songs. And, uh, you know, you put, you can just put a song on repeat and just keep going over and over and over. And they love that. And I said, and I was telling them, you know, when I was younger, we had tapes. And if you loved a song, you would have to wait to rewind it to the beginning <laughs> so you could play it again, which just, I mean, if you think about something like that, it just seems so painful because, you know, it, it took a while to rewind the song and then you had to get to the right point because you might have rewound it too far, you know, or not enough. It, yeah. So. <laughs> Oh, I hear you. <laughs> the littlest things. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, and and I see that like the, I mean, for me, technology now it's just like to be doing something like this to to on Instagram, right. just even be able to connect with people who you know you're in Germany and like connect with somebody, and then you know hop together on Zoom and just like talk about something it's I mean that kind of stuff blows my mind and that's yeah. sort of when I think about doing something like this and and why what sort of keeps me going is um sharing these stories is when I was younger I am that I think like oh my god what if there was a YouTube and what if I could go on YouTube and like look for things I'm interested in and learn about things like who would I be today because I feel like uh there's just such a I mean, that's just such an amazing opportunity. And I know it has its, there's issues with social media too, right? It's like, there's the good and the bad, but yeah. Anyway, I digress. This is, this is, about, this is about you. Yeah, no, I talk about myself a lot. I have no problem steering away from it. <laughs> um, so when are you in Germany until this time around? How long are you there for? I fly out July the 31st, so in about seven weeks. I've been okay. here since the end of September. Okay. Um, I come back to Bloomington, to my home city, uh-huh. because, I have, because I start classes the third week of August. So I have one more year of coursework for okay. my PhD. So I'm going to do the two semesters. I have uh, qualifying exams at the end, so April of next year, roughly, is quals. And once I pass that, I'll be ABD status, all but dissertation status. Okay. And my goal is to come back to Berlin in September of 2020. So right now I'm in the midst of researching and writing for grant funding to bring me back over here to do an expansion, to do a final research period for this topic. Um, the goal I've had for the last two years, easily the last two years, is of course to write my dissertation, but to write it in the form of a book. Because mm-hmm. one of the reasons I was interested in this topic in the first place is because there seemed to be a gap in not just the academic literature, but the, the open market literature about mm-hmm. women in German rap or women in German hip hop. And I've researched it long enough that I feel like I have enough interviews and enough information and, you know, you do the theory, theoretical support and things that I could buckle down and write a book for my dissertation. And that's the encouragement that I'm being given for my advisors behind me as well as far as 
supporting my idea of that, saying, yes, it sounds viable if you work hard enough. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my one-year goal is to pass my last, I'm a gender studies minor as well, so I've got that wrapped up into. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I love gender studies. That's a fascinating minor to me. So I, I got to finish that minor out as far with my courses. So finish my courses, pass my quals, obtain the funding to come back here again in September of 2020 when I'm done, and then do another 11 months is roughly what the exchange is of okay. researching and the beginning, if not the middle, stages of writing. And then I would have to return to the U.S. and defend my dissertation, and then I'd be done after I edited. So, and it was accepted. So oh. it's a lot. Now, not just in that year for the writing. I mean, I would, I would guess the writing would be accepted and finished and done maybe a year and a half, two years at most. That's my goal. I don't want it to go any longer than that. But God bless yeah. you. What? Um, we'll we we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, I just want to ask it now since we're like on this path. Like, what keeps you going? I mean, I know you know you want to help people, right? So, but there's like, t I mean, I'm I'm hearing this, and and it's hard. Like for anyone out there, I mean, I know you just went through it, but for anyone out there that just like a doctorate is like the pinnacle of you know where you can be <laughs> academically uh it, it is uh you know i don't know percentage wise how many people have doctorates in the united states or internationally but obviously that number is probably pretty small uh just because of how much you need to put into getting it and be and be smart obviously you're very smart but then you know you have to have both you have to be obviously really smart and then keep going so what keeps you going? Like what, what motivates you? I'm sure that, you know, there's times where you're, it's just like hard. What, what keeps you going on this path? I always keep in mind that there are individuals, men or women, either one, but especially my head's focused on women that have a lot more on their plate than I do. I have two children, but they're adults. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a young child right now. Right. Um, that's, that's a big one right there. Now, when I started school, my daughter was 11, but still, um, there are many women out there that are doing the exact same thing I am doing, but they are spinning more on their plate than I can comprehend. Yeah. And that's what motivates me. I read their stories on Instagram. I read the stories on the internet. You know, when I see them about women that are getting advanced degrees, master's, PhDs, also, the artists that I work here, too. Most of the artists I work with are academics. They're in school. Mm -hmm. They're either in undergraduate or master's or PhD programs. Some of them are mothers. Some of them have partners. Some of them are mothers and partners. Um, they work another job in addition to their art, depending on the level and the years of experience they have. Right. So, again, they have more on their plate than I do. I don't have any reason to feel sorry for myself, but it yeah, you get you do get tired. It happens. When that happens, I look at the women who I'm working with. I look at the women online who are working towards the same thing. And I draw inspiration from that. Mm -hmm. I just have to keep pushing. And yeah. there is there is a particular artist here in Berlin that I've uh, got to be very close to and she is an inspiration for me in that she's a, a great self-motivator for me. She, her name is Vivian Shakir. Okay. And she is a rapper and a singer here in Berlin. And she is someone that whenever I, I can, I'm very shy. I'll be honest. I'm a, I, I am a shy person. And whenever I would go to events and she would be with me or whatever I'm doing, whether it's walking around Berlin, talking a little bit she is the one that encourages me and says okay you need to get out there more because people are going to accept you they 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 will love what you're doing you know and Vivian and I are not together a lot because again she's an academic and an artist and etc and then I do what I do um, but the times that we are together she has been one of my biggest cheerleaders here I can't give her enough thanks for that that's awesome. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that awesome when you find those people in your life? Yeah, that's awesome. yeah they're amazing. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, you know, that's really awesome because I think that that's, that's what I do. I know that like, I, I t- it's God, so much of that resonates with me. I mean, when you have little kids, we have three little kids, we have two five and a half year olds and a six month old and it, there is no time for yourself. And I work full time at a demanding job and my wife works full time at a demanding job and we have a house <laughs> and a dog. Right. Although the dog is the easiest thing, but like, so it's just like, uh, people who haven't been there just don't understand like really like Mm -hmm. how hard it is. So on top of all of that, how do you fit in the things that you personally want to do? You know, like I want to, you know, make music and, you know, do this kind of stuff. And, you know, and it's so, it is, it's so hard because, you know, sometimes it's really hard to get up at 5 a.m. just to have two hours to yourself because you were up till 10, 30, 11 doing laundry and like, you know, food shopping. I, I would think I went out food shopping the other night at like 9.30, <laughs> you know, so, um, but, but, but to what you were saying, I, I always try and look at it, even though it's like, this is hard and these are the things I want and I have to, you know, uh, this is how I have to achieve it if, if, if I want to get there. But it's true. I too do the same thing and look at people on Instagram and there's all this visibility to other people who, you know, like are, are homeless and maybe doing the same, you know what I mean? Like people who are in a much more difficult spot than I am, but yet somehow they are still working towards their dreams or what they want to achieve or just making it happen. And, and I think that, it, that it's a great source of motivation. I'm there with you. I mean, there's a lot of, of people out there that face yeah. discrimination for other reasons too. And, they, and they're an inspiration, every single one of them, every single intersectional woman out there, every single disadvantaged person. I have nothing to complain about. Yeah, I'm trying to do what I do so that I can write about whatever experiences I've come across with the women I work with. Yeah, so yeah. cool. What um, wh- what kind of advice might you have for anybody who is, uh, you know, who watches this and maybe they're they're interested in in learning more about um just this pathway I mean is it just more like you would google like ethnomusicologist maybe and see what kind of programs there are throughout the uh your country for that I mean any any advice and you sorry sorry I didn't mean to cut you off no that's okay um yes in other countries I think it's called it's called musicology okay depending on the country if someone wanted to be an ethnomusicologist, that's what I would do. If I didn't, if I heard this for the first time, I would get online and I'd start Googling the word in whatever country I was in and see whatever school is best for them. Mm-hmm. The earlier, of course, someone could do that, the better. I mean, if they're in high school and they're doing it before they enter traditional school age, that's better. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're an older adult and that's what they want to do, that's good too. But the soonest you can do it, Make yeah. a plan. That's yeah. the biggest thing. Make a plan to get from step A to step B to, to C and D or whatever the end goal is. And once someone's found a few programs, go visit those universities. Make sure that that program is what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, friend request the people, the graduate students that are already online that are in those programs. Yeah. That's a good idea. Because they're the biggest source of information on how good the area is, what the cost of living is, and things like that. And then just realize that if you try hard enough and you look far enough for funding, or you do, you shuffle things around in your life, maybe wait a couple years if you have to, where there's a will to do it, there's a way. And if, whatever it is, if it's education, if it's a new car, if it's a new house, a different city to move to, a country to move to, make a plan as early as possible and just know that it's it's steps along the way and every step is a building stone to the ultimate foundation of wherever you're going. I'm also a big proponent too, like writing it down, like, right. Do you ever, I mean, somebody said that, right. If you have a plan, write it down. If you don't write it down, it's like not going to happen basically type of deal. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's a that's a big thing and then all the steps yeah that go to it um yeah. all right i want to go back i, I want to talk to you a little bit longer i know we've been on for it's been about 40 minutes now but um i i don't feel and i and it could be because i don't know the right i don't know the right questions to ask but i would love to dig in like a little bit more um to that intersection of like in that you're of culture and hip hop and these women like in in Germany and I'm just trying to like think of how to like get there um so is a lot of what you're doing like interview wise like hearing their stories like sort of is it is it like is it what kind of questions, I guess, are, are you asking these women when you're talking to them? Like, really, what are you trying to get down to? Um, and this is a big question. I think that's why I'm like, I'm not sure how to ask it. And, and however you um, interpret it is fine. <laughs> because, <laughs> like, I, it just, I'm try, it's like trying to wrap my head around, you know, the academic side of really digging into to all these factors that come into play with that intersection and just like what 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 are the things you're like learning or asking or i just want to talk about that more yeah that's no problem yes they they're interesting they're fascinating well on a typical interview i started out with asking them what was their earliest memory of hip-hop whatever art that they do or whatever art they first were interested in and how did that springboard from their earliest memory to where they're at now? What was that journey? And then after that, it is more focused on their activism and how they feel that their particular art in hip hop is, is or maybe isn't a social activist platform for their okay. beliefs and ideologies. And in asking those questions, you get a rounded picture, of course, of who they are as a person, what their initial stages were, what their end goals are, and how they feel they contribute to the society here. Hmm. And I've, I, you know, like I said, on my first fieldwork period, I started with just five ladies. And uh, let me think, two of them were MCs, were rappers. Um, two of them were DJs and, well, three of them were DJs. One um, was, is now a photographer. So she was a DJ way back. And they all were iconic in different decades. Um, the very first in interview I did was with one of the very first rappers that I ever saw online from the 19 late 1990s early 2000s so you and talked to the turkish the turkish woman you told us about i talked to aziza okay. this field work period but not the first oh, one okay okay so somebody else okay but um but yeah so it's it's like with the women that i interview i also try to round out my breadth of knowledge about it and speak to the ones that used to do it that started here in the business the ones that were in the interim right around the time the berlin wall fell because mm -hmm. rap here really changed once the country wasn't divided anymore and right. the flow of information was a lot freer back and forth in between the two sections of the country and the two sections of the city and then also i asked them uh, their experiences and let them tell me if those experiences are negative, positive, or a mixture of both. I mean, we all know that rap has its issues <laughs> as far as misogyny, discrimination, issues mm -hmm. such as that. It does in the United States. It does in other countries as well. It does here. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to hear their viewpoint on if that adds to the art in any positive or negative ways, and if it adds to the quality of their life or detracts from it, mm -hmm. and what they think are future avenues for this genre. Because you know, hip hop 
um, is such a global phenomenon. And one of the reasons is because it is a culture of chaos. Mm. <laughs> it, is, it, it started in the chaos of New York City and the fires and the broken glass theory and mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. And it started in diversity with two different cultures, African-American and the Latino culture and Jamaican culture. And it sprung out of a need to change the environment, a need to change the social fabric of the country. And it works, that's what I'm interested in the most, conscious rap, how social activism is enhanced through the usage of hip hop, through the uses of, uses of rap. And I've learned that it's not just rap that makes a difference, it's DJing. The DJs have explained to me how that particular art is a way of giving what they, giving the emotions that they want the audience to soak up, you know, mm -hmm. and, and also feeding back from what the audience is giving them mm -hmm. to try to make it someone's day better. Um, that the break dancing is a way to represent that art as well through the movement of bodies. Mm -hmm. And that graffiti is also a way to visually sign that you were there and that it is a subculture that, um, well, especially in Berlin, there's a lot of it and it's a beautiful art form here, but it is part of the culture that also is chaotic. And, and how something that can be so chaotic and can, can have negative elements purposely works together to bring attention to what's wrong. Mm -hmm. So that hopefully enough noise is made about a problem that the people that can address it above the normal person every day will pay attention and will do something to help mitigate the circumstances, help change it, things like that. Cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think that's, that's, that was awesome. Uh, because I think like somebody like me, like I probably, uh, up until the past year, didn't realize how global hip hop actually was, yeah. uh, just being here in the United States, uh, you know, <laughs> watching UMTV raps when I was <laughs> a lot younger and, right. um, I, I just not being exposed to other countries. Like when I talk to DJ Adada, like it's just, I, I'm just beginning to get exposed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. so it is so interesting to me the comments about you know hip hop being born out of chaos in new york and and how uh you know that's that people in these other countries in 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 their own chaos have 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 grabbed onto that and and it's their culture right. it so interesting to me i hope you write a book that's that's <laughs> you yeah. need to write a book <laughs> I, I have an obligation. <laughs> I have an obligation to to let these stories speak for themselves. Yeah. And and I really like the topic. I'm really emotionally invested and interested in the topic of hip hop. There's so many different places around the world that have vibrant, moving hip hop cultures. And what's so cool about hip hop is that it changes depending on the location. You know. Senegal has a great hip hop scene. I know um, online a couple of people in that scene and I've had to study that in classes. Um, uh -huh. South America does too. France, France has a great scene. You know, Ukraine, Ukraine has scenes. There are, there are things that go on in Asia. You know, it's a, it is all over the place. And I unfortunately only have so much time and energy that yeah. I chose Germany. <laughs> yeah. But, there's many other places and many other books that can be or have already been written about the other places as well. Um, and, and on that point, like, so there must be ethnomusicologists in America who are focusing specifically on women in hip hop uh, in America, I assume, and probably oh, books. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are interesting and great to read and, and some great people that do that. There are peers in my program that, um, delve into that. There are academic sources that I use that focus on the United States also. I just never focused on the United States simply because I was always interested in Germany. 
my father's ancestors came from Germany. Okay, cool. Okay. We, we even have a genealogy book my aunt prepared that with pictures and letters and birth certificates and marriage certificates that show the German American diaspora that my father's family of my father's family as they came over to the United States. And for many, many generations, they settled in one area and then they intermarried in the German American community. So that always fascinated me because I, <laughs> I latched onto it as a kid. It was like, oh, I'm German. I'm German American kind of thing. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, I'll enter high school and take German language courses and see where that goes. And so for me, it was an identity quest. Because I didn't feel I fit in anywhere else, but in my mind, in my imagined community, in my mind, yeah, I fit in in Germany. So, so you so, speak German? I You're... do speak German. I've taken enough classes, okay. and I've, I'm around enough people, although we in interviews, all code switch back and forth, and of course my English is a lot stronger than my German, yeah. but my German's passable. Sure. <laughs> Um, it's so interesting, like going back to that, like one of the, um, one of my early experiences with music, I feel like was, um, well, at least initially with hip hop was Queen Latifah, uh, and, uh, the song Ladies First. Yes. And for me, and this is interesting, so I just want to put this out there. Um, like I, I almost feel and I'm curious, other people probably have the same exact story as me, but I feel like that song and seeing Queen Latifah um, as a, I don't know how old I was, I'll have to figure out how old I was, um, as a young girl, that was the first time I realized, wait a second, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Why can't, you know, like I just, seeing her, it made me feel empowered. You yeah. know, like I had been getting maybe these messages like, uh, boys are better than girls and like girls can't do this or can't do that you know and I feel like that was the the like first because she was like really like very strong and present you know like even like in her videos and stuff and I think that was the imagery that I got and then there was that song and I was like yeah ladies like I, I just felt um so so to me when I think of hip-hop and my first experiences it's just feeling like a as a woman like feeling empowered like so and then even like mc light was just like uh, and and just being like a a white young girl in in full of uh, in a white area in new jersey right like i i mean you know I, I, it was this 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 um i don't know just seeing a strong black woman out mm -hmm. there was was so empowering to me uh Anyway, that's my story. So I just want, it's so interesting in like how you're saying like all, how it intersects too, like the gender studies and all that right. stuff and um, all the massage and stuff and hip hop. But yeah. yeah. So, and then of course, Missy Elliott, like who you were talking about. So that, so, you know, we go from Queen Latifah and then we fast forward to like, as I get older and then there's Missy Elliott, who again, it's like, okay, like, you know, strong back black woman who's not going to take anybody's, you know, shit. Like... <laughs> so those, those women are inspirations and yeah. they they are icons flat out they are icons um, yeah they should be to everyone but they most definitely are to me yeah. you know one thing I wanted to mention as you were talking though <laughs> is that and this has to go back to the research topic I do and this is something that I think is important even for me to always remember mm -hmm. is when I this topic I I mean technically I research women in German hip-hop but it's German hip-hop <laughs> because it I go back and forth but a lot of the artists will tell me too yes I, I am a woman or I am what I identify with um, this gender or whatever that they choose but really at the end of the day we're all just artists we yeah. all just do hip-hop whether whatever we identify with at the end of the day. So I do want it, I do want to put that out there for anybody that's hearing it. I'm very aware of the idea that by saying I research women in German hip hop, it is gendering it. It's a it's a back and forth thing. It is giving the honor to the people that identify as female or as a woman and also stating with with their own words that at the end of the day 
they would prefer just to be known as German hip hop artists too. Yeah. That's interesting. I've gone back and forth with stuff like that in my head just in the past, like I feel over the past five years, because I think like I used to come from this place where it was like, well, I'm just a, I'm just a DJ. I, I, am a, I want to be known as a DJ, not, a, you know, not, I don't want it to be like a factor that I'm a woman or, you know, like, but I think the more and more I think about it in the conversation I have, like, I think that come, it is, uh, it is such a part of the journey and experience to try to to separate that and just say, well, I'm, I'm a DJ or I'm, I, I'm this, like it, I, I almost like I've got to this point where I feel like, well, that's like a disservice to myself because like there are, there are things that I, that I I've, I've dealt with because I've been a woman and I just, and like almost, but almost like I didn't want to um, recognize that. I don't know. It's, it's weird. And that's my, probably my own personal story. But I'm like, you know, with DJing, for example, that's the biggest thing I can think of. But as I look back, I, I see how, how there are things I didn't do, didn't say, um, oh. or, or probably didn't move forward to try to achieve because in some way or another, I felt uh, that because I was a woman, like maybe that wasn't obtainable or, uh, or the right path. But anyway... Right. So it's all a learning process. And for me, I just want to represent these artists the way they want to be yeah. represented. Um, yeah, one last thing, because it's so interesting to me, and I have to ask, <clears throat> um, because it, I assume it must be somewhere part of your studies. How about, uh, we're talking about German hip hop, like, are there any gay German hip hop figures? Or, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. There are. There, there is a whole subgenre of it here, and a lot of them will title themselves in the subgenre of queer feminist rap. Oh, okay. So, so yes, um, there are women that are artists that advocate through their art on behalf of the LGBTQIA community. Uh -huh. um, some of those artists identify within that community. Um, it just depends on their personal preference and how they want to present themselves and what mm -hmm. they're doing. But yes, there are. There are cool. um, artists over here. There, there's a couple that I know of that are transsexual rappers. And, and I say that because that's how they identify themselves in mm -hmm. the public. So yes, yeah, there's, all, there's an entire subgenre of that. And that is a part of my research. Mm -hmm. and a poster presentation in about a week and a half at the university here and I chose to focus on that subtopic of my overall topic because as I talked to artists and got to know different names and different pro artistic profiles I realized and through their own words that that is an important niche over here is the queer feminist rap and and I mean those artists cross over the ones that right um, are in that group and the ones that maybe don't completely outwardly identify as being an artist with that platform, they cross over and do their gigs together. So, I mean, really it's not a daily in a line, but it is uh -huh. one a term that I heard over and over again that I never had heard in the U S before. Uh -huh. it, yeah. It could exist with us. It maybe I just hadn't heard of it. And, and that's what I say about everything because <laughs> there's just so much stuff. Um, I, I, yeah, I was just thinking about it now, and uh, and then I was thinking as you were talking, like, well, I I don't really know if in the U.S. like I'm not a part of that scene. Like, I don't maybe here, maybe not. Right. Um, Belenza, Belenza is a rapper here in Berlin that is in that LGBTQIA group. Uh huh. Um, there are a couple that I have not interviewed yet. One of them's named Suki. The other one is named Sir Mantis. Okay. I have. I have spent time and interviewed their promoter. Uh -huh. So I knew of those artists, but, but had not yet touched base with them. So yes, those artists exist here too. And they do, they do great work just like any other artist. Yeah. Um, I'm going to close Fresh this out. Flute. What's that? What? DJ Fresh Flute. That's another one that advocates on behalf of that group as well and others. Thank you for spitting out all these names. Cause that's like so helpful, especially like, yeah, I mean, to get turned on to stuff in another country when you're here in the U.S. It's yeah. really cool. Um, I'm going to, 
I've had so much fun talking to you today. I can't believe it's been an hour, uh, but it's just, yeah, it's like all new to me. Um, and I think that's like such a, an amazing, I'm so grateful for people like you who would like to spend an hour <laughs> and talking about this stuff because um, it was really great to hear more about you and what you're doing and your experiences and thoughts on life. And I think that this information is super valuable to those that listen to this and watch this. And, um, you know, and I always see these, like, this is going to live on YouTube forever. So who knows, 10 years from now, somebody may watch this and be like, this is awesome, which is, you know, why I keep doing what I'm doing. Um, so thank you for agreeing to, to, to talk with me today. Well, thank you for, for talking to me, and, and I thank everybody out there that's going to listen to this and take away anything, you know, out of it at all, because there are wonderful artists here doing great things, and all you have to do is Google their names, YouTube their names, and you can pull it up. So can you, so I'm going to put Amy's, all Amy's information down below in the description. So where you can find her on Instagram and all the platforms. Um, but also Amy, I'm going to ask you if you can shoot me an email that includes some of these names because you know, some of the spelling we may not get right, but, and then I'll list that out in the description because it will give people opportunity to maybe, you know, find that person on Spotify and, and listen to their music. And right. And they're um, there, they're there, and they, they use SoundCloud, et cetera. So okay. yeah, I'll do yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, and we'll turn some people on to, to some new music for sure. Um, but have a great day. Uh, again, right. thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I love talking yeah, to you. I hope I get to talk to you again. I feel like I'll, I'm talking to so many amazing people. It's like it's like you talk for an hour and it's like, I feel like I've made a new friend because I really love so no, much of what you're saying. Amazing. So hopefully maybe someday I, I'm not too close to Indiana, but you never know. Maybe you'll be in New York someday in, in New York City and we can yeah. hook up or something. <laughs> Well, I, I need to come to Brooklyn. I got to see, you know, where it all started. Yeah. And, and, you know, good luck to you. I know you have a long road ahead of you for sure, but I am excited to, to celebrate with you via social media when that day comes. And, uh, and, and you are, you are a doctor, 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 hip hop academic. <laughs> all right. Have a great day. You too. Thanks right. a lot. Yep. Bye. bye.